we at Wilberforce Publications are really delighted to be publishing this book, Same Sex Parenting Research. Um, I've had the, the privilege of being able to have some time to read it, and um, I can tell you there's a, a lot of research and depth gone into this book, um, collating evidence from approaching 400 uh, different academic articles on the subjects of same-sex parenting. Um, clearly a controversial subject, and maybe we'll get into that a bit today as well. Um, Andrea, do you want to say a few words as well before we start? Um, I'm actually wondering if Dr. Shum will a be able to put an end to the controversy and maybe whether this book puts an end to the controversy in that here what we have is a uh, comprehensive study um, of parenting research and outcomes um, in same-sex families. We thank uh, Dr. Shum for um, uh, assessing this, for looking at this, for producing this book for Wilberforce Publications. It is very vital. Why is it very vital? Well, we have the outworkings of it um, present here, even in this room, when a culture denies the science. So um, sitting in front of me is Richard Page, who's a magistrate, who as a result of saying behind closed doors, uh, children do best with a mother and father, was removed from the magistracy. And the child uh, was denied the parents that wanted him, foster parents that had had him, had the child from birth, and the child was placed into a same-sex household. And actually raising the evidence, which was something that Richard Page sought to do uh, throughout, that was denied to him. There was a denial of the science and a denial actually of what was in front of them. Uh, but just for saying that, behind closed doors, um, he lost his position as a magistrate. And then for speaking in public on it and saying um, that children do best with a mother and father, was then punished by um, having his non-executive directorship removed from the NHS Trust in Medway in Kent because it was asserted that future service users might be put off from accessing the services of Medway in Kent because this person was um, on the non-executive directorship. Also with us, we have um, a couple um, who um, they, um, the, the great thing with regard to them is that they came to the Christian Legal Center and they were fostering two children at the time. Um, and they, would be, they were told that their children were gonna be placed into a same-sex household. They'd wanted to adopt these children. And then as a result of our intervention, we were able to ensure um, that the children uh, went, were stayed. And since then, their, um, their baby brother has been born. So we're very grateful uh, for that. So we look forward now, and I'm hoping that the technology works. We, um, we, that's wonderful. So we look, Dr. Shum, we're very much looking forward to your presentation to us this afternoon. Thank you. Um, great. So um, Dr. Shum is appearing on the screen. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Shum has authored several books. He's authored over 250 peer-reviewed articles, um, 80 book chapters and technical reports. He's uh, married. He's been married heterosexually, I, I'm sure, um, with um, seven children and 20 or more, and counting, I presume, grandchildren as well. Um, Dr. Shum, you should have a handout on your um, chair, which I think Dr. Shum will refer to. Um, if you'd like to um, sort of text questions to me, um, we'll try and get that working as well so that I can sort of um, collate questions, but we're very keen to have questions with them as well. But Dr. Shum, over to you. I know you've got some things to share um, with us, and uh, we look forward to what you've got to say. Thank you. Yeah, good morning. Um, yeah, I try to uh, put my uh, speech here in writing so uh, you can uh, refer to that. I start off by mentioning how the Atlantic magazine uh, published a paper on January 15th. Uh, it sort of covered all the bases. Um, it was looking at transgender children, uh, but it also mentioned uh, Evelyn Hooker's research, and implicitly it 
probably referred to same-sex parenting. So, um, I mentioned my father used to say the road to hell was paved by good intentions, but it's actually paved by good intentions and bad statistics and weak theory. So what have we been told about uh, scientific truth? Well, first of all, from Evelyn Hooker's research in 1957 onward, we're told that homosexuality is a neutral phenomenon, and if it has any negatives, it's due to uh, discrimination. Uh, we've been told in the research that there's millions of intact same-sex couples in the U.S. Uh, with as many as 28 million children uh, being raised by such couples, even though that would approach half the children in the United States. Uh, we're told that same-sex parents are no different than heterosexual parents. Uh, we're told the outcomes of their parenting are no different in any respect for any of the variables there. And we're being told now that the outcomes for transgender children are no different uh, than for cisgender children. And if you don't agree with these conclusions, uh, basically people are going to make every attempt to destroy your reputation and career. Now there's a very famous scholars within Britain, uh, Dr. Susan Gollenbach has uh, written a book here. This is called uh, Modern Families, and it looks at not just same-sex uh, parent families, but a wide variety of other families, and the basic argument is that there's really not many differences between them uh, that couldn't be accounted for by uh, minority stress theory. Uh, Dr. Michael Lamb has uh, done a lot of work. Uh, there's many popular books out there. This is by Carlos Ball, and he's written several books on uh, same-sex parenting issues. And uh, in some cases, uh, Charlotte Patterson of the University of Virginia argued in a 2005 paper that there hadn't been a single paper in the history of the world that uh, any, found any evidence to contradict uh, the ideas I mentioned, although she actually had a footnote that said there was one, but she kind of ignored that. Uh, as far as number six goes, uh, Mark Greg Nares of the University of Texas uh, dared to publish one paper on same-sex parenting that uh, had its own problems, but it was still one of the better data sets. And he suffered criticism. Uh, 200 scholars got together and wrote a letter critiquing him. Uh, a judge demanded and released the names of the reviewers of the paper, and the editor kind of disappeared pretty quickly of that journal after it was published. So if you flip over to the second page, uh, I note that the Williams Institute of the UCLA School of Law in Los Angeles has stated that we believe in data at a time when perspective often poses as evidence the Williams Institute remains committed to rigorous independent research on sexual orientation and gender identity. And I agree with uh, what they say there. Now, what I'm going to do here is to share uh, scientific data that refutes all of those ideas. And I hope you're shocked by this because it really goes against the grain. Um, and I'm not sure even conservatives appreciate the revolution that this represents. Um, now, since the books come out, there have been uh, studies reported, and for the most part, they agree with uh, what's in the book. Uh, first of all, Evelyn Hooker's research, uh, it's widely reported that she compared 30 gay men and 30 heterosexual men and found no differences whatsoever uh, between the two samples. And the samples had quite a number of problems with them. 10% uh, of the men in each sample were bisexuals and many other issues I mentioned here. But there actually were significant differences. And the judges that were evaluating who was who had a 40% success rate. But she claimed that wasn't significant because it was a probability of 0 0.05 rather than being less than 0 0.05. But my research was able to predict 80% uh, correctly uh, who was who. So there were significant differences between the men, and you could predict uh, with pretty good accuracy who was in which group, uh, even though 10% of both groups were bisexual. So that could have accounted for a lot of that difference. Now, in the area of same-sex parenting, if you flip the next page over, uh, we've been told in research that the uh, numbers were as high as 14 to 28 million children in the U.S. 
One study claimed 14 million children had been adopted by same-sex couples. Now, there's a recent book that's just come out uh, that indicates there's only 200,000 same-sex couples raising children in the U.S. But in your other handout, the Williams Institute, uh, this past year, after the book came out, has estimated 114,000 uh, same-sex couples. And uh, Professor Sullins of Catholic University, using uh, national health uh, interview survey data, uh, come up with 116,000 as his best estimate. So it would appear the latest estimates of the numbers of children being raised by same-sex couples and how many intact same-sex couples there are is uh, much, much smaller uh, than what was claimed. I don't mention this in the paragraph here, but it all began with a 1984 newspaper article in USA Today, which claimed there were uh, 7 million uh, children being raised by same-sex couples. And then that got picked up in a 1992 article in Child Development by Charlotte Patterson, and from then on it became accepted as scientific fact. Now, the second issue is how stable are same-sex couples? And it's been argued uh, that they are just as stable now, some people have argued they should be more stable. But the most recent book here by Goldberg and Romero uh, claims that lower stability rates have been reported since the 19, actually it's the 1980s, they claim. Uh, so who would have known this? Because <laughs> until recently, most people argued that the research evidence didn't show it. So now it's been rewritten and it's been known for 20 or 30 years. Uh, now, I had a paper under review in my journal, which is using national probability samples, and they find uh, that there's greater instability among same-sex parents when they have children, uh, whereas heterosexual couples, they have greater stability when they have children. So there's an opposite pattern here. Uh, the flip side of the coin is if same-sex couples don't have children, uh, they are much more stable. So... Uh, Authors that have said in the past that they were just as stable were correct if they were referring to same-sex couples that did not have children. Now, uh, on the third section here, uh, there is some evidence that same-sex parents do differ in their values. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it's been a tough area. Um, one area that's been debated quite often is whether same-sex couples are more likely to have lesbian, gay, or bisexual children, and I did a look at 72 literature reviews published since 2001, and 90% of those concluded that there was no effect. But, in fact, uh, there is pretty much a very strong effect in this area. Uh, one study you probably never heard of found that 57.5% of the children of same-sex parents in this particular study uh, were not heterosexual, compared to 4% of the uh, children of the heterosexual parents. Yeah, we don't have a lot of data on why that is. Um, I looked at uh, some of the anecdotal evidence in this particular article in the International Journal for Jurisprudence of the Family, and anecdotally, a lot of the same-sex parents encourage their kids to try uh, the same gender if they weren't having success heterosexually. Now, item B here, the issue of drugs illustrates the uh, problem of whether there's difference or harm. Uh, Gartrell and her colleagues in their national lesbian study in the U.S. Uh, published an article in the Journal of Health Psychology where they found that 60% of the children of these lesbian mothers were using illegal drugs, at least occasionally, by age 17, compared to 21% of the youth, also age 17, from the random national study. Well, that's a very, very powerful difference, but can we argue that it represents harm? Well, I imagine quite a few people would argue it wasn't a matter of harm, thanks, Charlie. Um, and so uh, their mental health appeared to be similar uh, when they looked at it. So they could argue that, well, so what if they're using drugs? So difference is one thing, proving harm is another. Uh, on the national effects issue, it's been claimed that uh, there's no uh, effects at a national level of legalizing same-sex marriage and parenting. Uh, 
Uh, but when I looked at that problem, if you look at how many years it's been since the states individually approved the same-sex marriage or had a court demand it, uh, then you find out that there's a relationship between how long the state has approved of same-sex marriage and a negative effect in, or impact on fertility. Now, I do mention here that a lot of people have claimed that legalizing same-sex marriage was a neutral phenomenon that might even promote traditional marriage. But in my book, I present works by Mason and by Green that suggest that at least some uh, gay scholars wanted to destroy heterosexual marriage uh, because they wanted to queer it, and they wanted to make uh, it okay for heterosexual couples to commit adultery and not have any stigma for that. Now, I've argued that same-sex marriage, when it's legalized, doesn't create equality as much as it creates inequality. And I have a whole paper on that, and I mention that in the book as well. Now, on the transgender issue, I've been trying to work on a literature review for that, and I've been stuck just on two articles that have been published. And these articles are highly cited, and they claim that there's no mental health differences between transgender children and cisgender children if the parents are supporting the trans transgender children in their transition. But, <coughs> excuse me, when I looked at that data closely and got more data from the authors, it turns out that they have uh, significant and substantial differences in anxiety, and they also have uh, significant and substantial differences in their self-worth, and they have uh, some significant, but uh, a larger number of differences in depression as well. So the result is actually, if you understand the data properly, is that even when they have parental support, their mental health is worse, even though the authors argue that if they have parental support, then their mental health is no different. Now, I do mention on the next page that it's difficult to go against the grain on some of these ideas. They talk about how I've had students who drop my classes because even on something neutral like smallpox vaccine, I've shown that some of the research is very questionable. And uh, one author had to report that he had another 20 errors in his paper after I pointed out one error. But of course he said it wasn't a problem. <laughs> It never is a problem when you make mistakes, I guess. Um, now, I have a theory which you should have a diagram there of, and this is an attempt to try to explain morality from a non-religious perspective, uh, so we can kind of look at it scientifically. And uh, the top line there is the A line, and this is something that's good for you and presumably for other people in the short run and the long run. So eating your veggies would probably be something that'd be good for you and it'd be good for your family because you'd live longer. So making decisions like that is probably good for your family and for other people. Now there are some decisions that may look good in the short run, uh, but they have long-term negative outcomes and that's the B line. And using Heroin or something would be something like this. You'd feel great in the short run, but in the long run, it would probably kill you. I don't know if I've written, but there's a lot of people dying of uh, opioid uh, overdoses in the United States. Now, line C is like saving money for retirement. It costs you something in the short run, but in the long run, you can enjoy your retirement better. So uh, that means you sacrifice in the short term, but you have a better result in the long term. So basically, for society to be optimal, my argument is you need people to make A decisions and C decisions. Now the line D is things that are bad in the short run and the long run. I'm not too sure how often that occurs because um, most people probably do things because they think there's some short-term benefit. Uh, there may be people that are mentally ill and make a level D decision. Now, where this comes into play, uh, there was a scholar who was trying to defend uh, homosexual behavior among youth, and the peculiar way that he chose to defend this was he claimed that one of these youth said that gay youth have all the fun. 
Well, that may be true, but that could be a feline decision that you're having a lot of fun and more sex than other people now. But uh, what are the long-term consequences going to be? Uh, now, part of the problem with that is if you only look at the short term, B decisions look as good as A decisions. And you have to look long term to see that C decisions are as good as A and B are as bad as D. Um, now, sexuality will play into this. I think you can see how easily it would play into this model. Um, it's easy for the guy to have fun and the girl gets pregnant and then she's stuck with the pregnancy or the abortion or whatever. So it may look great from the guy's perspective, but the long term's not very good from the woman's perspective. So I think this is why society has generally developed rules about sexuality to try to prevent sexuality from becoming a B type of decision. And marriage, in some sense, I think, is a attempt to convert what could be a B level decision into more of an A level decision. Uh, even though the sacrifices involved in marriage may make it a C decision no matter what. Uh, I'm still working on papers here that, on the last page of your handout that I call uh, cherry picking. That if you look at transgenderism or uh, same sex parenting, homosexuality, uh, there can be a lot of uh, benefits associated with this, uh, in the short run at least. Uh, but the question is, what happens in the long run? And in general, whether it's fair to have some people cherry picking when other people aren't allowed to do that. So that's where I think it creates some social inequity. Um, now, you've probably heard of Professor Jordan Peterson. I bet you that if you read his book, The Twelve Rules, uh, that uh, a lot of what he's talking about is really summarized in that diagram I have. He talks about how parents, uh, when they're raising their children, uh, should be patient with them, attend to their needs, uh, not neglect them, spend more time with them. Uh, these are costly activities, and so it takes something to uh, perform them in the short run, but in the long run, uh, Peterson argues that your children will be a lot better off. So he's really talking about parents engaging in C-level activities. Uh, you could engage in a B-level type of decision with your kids. You could just, you know, say, well, if you won't eat, well, we'll just won't feed you. and won't take the time to bother, like one case he talked about where the child wouldn't eat. Um, yeah, it's a lot easier just to neglect the child, uh, but that's not going to help the child in the long run. And uh, he talks about in one chapter about petting cats is a good thing to do. Well, that's probably sort of an A-level activity that boosts your immune system and uh, it's nice for the cat and helps you in the long run, too. So he's probably talking about an A-level activity there. Now, I'm uh, very open to uh, questions or comments. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of detail which I haven't covered here. A lot of times to understand what's going on, you've got to really get into the weeds uh, with some of this research. And from my perspective, it's amazing what you'll find, but... Uh, for some people, like maybe just too much detail. But I'm open for comments or questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Sham. That was um, a very interesting and insightful summary of, of some of what you're saying um, in the book there. Um, we've got a roving mic if people have got questions, so, so do indicate um, about that, or you can text me um, on that number, and I hopefully should be able to receive that and, and pose a question like that. Um, can I start, though, um, Dr. Shum, with a question for you? Um, you mentioned about courts um, being swayed by evidence that um, doesn't stack up. Is, is there, um, do you think there's any possibility that things might change in that, or that you know, your research, or perhaps you or other people being expert witnesses, could cause the, ch the courts to change their views and accept a different opinion on this? Well, what I find uh, distressing about the way the courts work in the United States is that you can go to the court and you can present them bad evidence and if they accept it, they'll make a decision that's in line with that bad evidence. But once they make the decision, it's pretty hard to go back on it. Um, and so I'm not sure if it makes any difference if you prove the evidence was wrong because in our system, it appears that the courts tend to really hate to reverse themselves, even if they were lied to in the first place. 
And then criminal evidence, I think they may have some ability to modify their outcomes a little bit, but I'm not optimistic because I just don't think the courts are going to uh, go back on their opinions, uh, even if there is new evidence. Okay. But as a scientist, I'm not a lawyer, you see, so I'm more interested in the truth getting out there than I am in a lawyer might be in changing the court's opinions. Okay. Um, and perhaps um, you've got an appendix in your book called A Fair Fight, um, Dr. Shum, um, which is about the academic world and how the academic world has been closed minded and, and closed to this kind of perspective and biased in this kind of way. Could you just kind of talk about that um, and, and your experiences there and your view on whether the academic world will change in terms of being scientific in the way they look at this? Well, it's, it's very difficult in the academic environment. I was informed recently that my organization, uh, it's my main organization, uh, tried to strip me of my fellow stats because they didn't like uh, the research I was publishing, some of which is in this book. I mean, that's just amazing. We had a faculty member on the board at the time, so she stopped it, uh, but only by claiming, well, maybe I have Alzheimer's or something. But uh, the week this book came out, mysteriously and coincidentally, the fire marshal showed up in my office and uh, said that, well, your office is not passing our test because you have books laying flat on your bookshelves and uh, you've got boxes of paper stacked up and you're not allowed to have anything more than two inches of paperwork at any spot in your office. So it took me a week to clean it up to meet his specifications, which, you know, got in the way of a lot of other stuff I had to do. Um, I've had students complain. Uh, I mean, they're just very sensitive around me because they know my background. And I was using an example in class where I talked about how a racist had used the N-word. I wasn't approving of it. I was very critical of the racist for doing it, but they still turned me in for using racist language. And, I eventually cleared myself after a week or two, but I mean, it's just, you're going to be subjected to continual harassment, and my colleagues say they're embarrassed to have me around because we always have to justify why the department hasn't fired me yet, and so after this past semester, I just told them, okay, I'm going to go into phased retirement and are from the chance to let me work from home, which is unheard of. They almost never do that, but they were so eager to get rid of me. They said, you can work from home and you won't even have an office here anymore. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Well, I hope you so do. You really have to be prepared to have your career destroyed if you try. Uh, well, I hope you do continue um, producing research, Walter, because it's very, very valuable and um, we don't want to see you to stop at all. In fact, we want to promote it and and tell the world about it, really. So I think it's very valuable research indeed. Um, some questions um, from people. Anybody, anybody got a question um, they'd like to ask? Yes, David. Yeah, go on. Um, thank you so much for what you shared. Um, are there um, sort of official or government statistics on this? So we've got the Williams Institute paper here. I don't know the scene in America. Does the government produce official stats on adoption numbers, same-sex adoption, and, and that sort of thing? Well, they're trying to get better at it. I'm not, I don't normally use much in the way of government stats because uh, I'm generally critiquing journal articles or book chapters. Uh, when uh, Paul Sullins, in his uh, paper that he's put, done speeches on, but he hasn't published uh, this one here, he uh, uses government data from the NHIS study. It's a U.S. government study, and they find that there's about 116,000 same-sex couples. And he has it broken down by uh, the number of male and female couples and then the number of uh, male and female children that they have. And he compares them uh, to intact heterosexual couples and cohabiting heterosexual couples and single parents. So some of that data is available. Uh, the main thing that he finds is that there's questions in the study about how your, what your child's emotional health is like and how does, does the child have problems in that area. And one over the world, it's running 15 to 20 percent is the case for same-sex parents, and it's running about 2 to 5 percent for uh, heterosexual uh, married parents. 
So uh, it's a ratio of, you know, anywhere from two and a half to three to four. Uh, but the flip side of the coin is you can say that 80% of same-sex parents are saying their kids aren't having uh, more emotional problems. Okay. Um, a question's come through, Walter. Um, in, in the medical world, a lot of research is funded by pharmaceutical companies that are wanting to obviously present some research that supports their products. In, in this world of social sciences and in relating to these issues around parenting and so on, who is funding the research? Is there an agenda behind it? Do you have any comments on that? Well, if you look at the funding sections for a number of the papers on same-sex parenting, um, they have a number of different funding sources. Um, in the book, I think I mentioned it as an example because uh, <laughs> the papers always conclude that they're not biased because of their funding sources, uh, even though they're all very pro-gay. And, of course, I've been criticized because I've had some funding uh, from the uh, Witherspoon Institute and the uh, uh, Center in Austin, Texas, that's a spinoff of that. Uh, and I've got some funding from the Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, but compared to what these other folks are getting, it's pretty minimal. Uh, mainly, you know, part of my summer salary sometimes has been covered uh, on some of these grants. But I'd like to thank that I try to stay as unbiased as I can uh, in spite of the funding sources. Yeah, okay. And uh, did you have a question? Uh, a comment? It was really at that point, um, just in terms of uh, the commissioning of this research, to um, thank Chris Sugden from the uh, Oxford Centre for Religion and Public Life for um, commissioning uh, the research, because I think it's very timely and very vital. And as we hear Dr. Shum and the kind of... Um, funding that goes into or the alternative uh, research or papers and to, to, to see uh, the kind of level we, we're at, then this kind of thing is extraordinarily valuable. I think what's difficult to um, listen to, Dr. Shum, is the fact that um, you have experienced this kind of uh, pushback in terms of your own assessment of the evidence your own cynicism as to whether the, uh, we could turn things around from, uh, from a court perspective at the Christian Legal Center were involved in many cases um, involving evidence where outcomes with regard to children raised in same-sex households or children who want to identify as um, in, the opposite, uh, in the opposite gender. We're dealing with much of this, but the evidence is being ignored. So again, I think a big question, how if in academia the evidence is being ignored, the hard social science is being ignored, despite the fact that we've got it uh, in terms of, um, in, in very hard evidence. What, I know that you have to keep on doing what you're doing there, and we have to keep on doing what we're doing, but what do you see the key? Do you see, do you see any key in terms of your long experience? And also indeed your military experience. Um, if you could, I mean, you've obviously had some um, experience in battle, as it were. Um, so, p bringing all those things together, do you have any well, um, ideas I mean, for us? It's the problem with the research is not so much that people. I don't think they're, for the most part, uh, fabricating data to make it come out the way they want. I generally assume the data they're dealing with is correct. It's just that they manipulate it so it comes out to fit their point of view. Now, people could argue, well, maybe you're manipulating it to come out to your point of view. I'll give you an example. Uh, in Olson's recent work, she looked at self-worth. And so she had 100 or so transgender children, and she had 100 or so non-transgender children in a control group, and she did try to match them a little bit. And so she wanted to look at her self-worth. Well, if you look at her paper that was published in a medical journal in 2017, Durwood et al., she breaks the transgender and cisgender children into three age groups. So she has them in these three different age groups from age 5 to age 12 or 14. And she takes the significance level that's required 
and divides it by three, so instead of looking at 0.05, you're looking at 0.015, and she runs t-tests on it and finds out basically there's no differences, significant differences. So she concludes that the self-worth of the transgender children is exactly the same as the self-worth of the uh, cisgender children. And therefore, she concludes that at the same-sex parents, not the same-sex parents, but if the parents of the transgender children love them enough and support them in transitioning, then everything's fine. The problem is I asked her for the data for the whole group, but she didn't report. So she gave it to me, and it turns out that the self-worth of the transgender children, if you look at the total sample on both groups, is significantly lower, with an effect size, I think, of 0.26, which is in the small to medium range. But the overall difference is statistically significant. And if you look at your three groups, and you don't divide by three, then there is a statistically significant difference for the largest group and the middle age group. And the other groups, they're not statistically significantly different, but the direction is against the self-worth of the transgender children. And if you look at how it's changing over time, the self-worth of the transgender children and the cisgender children are both going downhill over time. But in every age group, it's lower for the total and for each age group. It's the self-worth is lower for the transgender children. That's a completely different interpretation of the data than what she's given. And so the problem is, if you don't dig into it, you're not going to see that. And it will just bulldoze you over in court because they'll say, well, you know, Dr. So-and-so has published this paper, and we've got 200 other people who agree with her, and, you know, people just throw up their hands and quit. But if you have to dig into the data and look at what's really going on, and then you can find out that the net result is basically a bald-faced lie is what it really amounts to. But if you're not able to dig into that data and look for what they're not saying as well as what they are saying, you're not going to catch them at it. And, you know, that's one thing that makes me unpopular is people don't like to get caught with their pants down, which is what I tend to do on a lot of occasions. <laughs> and the books are full of examples of that. Um, one, one thing that we sometimes get um, pushback here, uh, Walter, is um, when we cite research from the US and people sort of pour scorn on to, well, that's just in the US and, and that's biased or whatever. Do you, do you have a comment on how translatable, I mean, a lot of this research is in the US, is it not? What about other cultures and that sort of thing? Well, most of the data we have comes from either Britain or the Netherlands. Uh, for example, on drug use, uh, Gollenbach and Badger, I believe, did a study in 2010 and they did not find any difference in terms of, I believe it was marijuana use between the children of same-sex parents and uh, heterosexual parents. So that's very different than what we found in the Gartrell study. So sometimes you don't find uh, some of the same differences. Um, this, there was a study done in the Netherlands, and they looked at uh, what they call a civic ability or something, and, you know, to be a good citizen or something, and they found that the children of same-sex parents in the Netherlands got higher scores on their civics variable uh, than other children did. Um, so you probably see, on average, less problem with same-sex parents in Europe than you do in America, but I don't have any firm data on that. That's just an anecdotal observation. Okay. Um, the argument's been made in some places, for example, in the, in the Netherlands, which is very... Uh, supportive of homosexuality, that there shouldn't be the same differences in mental health between gay men and heterosexual men, for example. And you still find uh, important differences even under conditions of uh, high social support. So, you know, I'm sure that social support's a factor, but it doesn't appear to account for everything. Okay. Um, I've had a question come through here. Is, is there anybody? Any organizations in the U.S. campaigning to try and get the Department of Justice to change their view that same-sex parenting is, makes no difference? Well, that it does make a difference? Or well, the view that it doesn't make a difference? Um, I don't know if anybody's campaigning for it right now. Um, 
who frankly hasn't been a lot of interest in my book in the U.S. I mean, I sent it to focus on the family and James Dobson and a lot of similar types of uh, conservative religious people, and they uh, haven't shown very much interest in it. I sent a book to the president of um, Hillsdale College, and he wrote a letter back and said, well, maybe the book could start a conversation. And I was a little disappointed. I thought it was going to end the conversation, but <laughs> at least to some extent. But um, here in the U.S., not a lot of response on it. I think um, I wrote one religious leader, and uh, he basically said we lost to get over it. Um, so he wasn't really interested in you know, trying to challenge the stuff in court. Um, the court thing's been pretty tough. I mentioned in the book when I went to a trial in Florida, uh, they told each side that we had to present all of our evidence that we were going to present in court had to be written down and presented like several weeks in advance of the trial. So both sides would have a chance to read what the other side would say. So we did it and then kept wondering, where's the material from the other side? Where is it? Where is it? Well, they were smart because they knew if they presented it in writing, I'd tear it up. So they just didn't present anything. And so we go to court, and they've got everything I said, and if I missed a period someplace, they're going to crit critique it. But I had nothing to critique on their part. So then in the middle of the trial, then they introduced their written evidence. <laughs> and the judge had to act like she was upset, but in the end, she allowed it to go. Well, and so their experts got to testify how terrible my research was and blah, 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 but I wasn't allowed to hear what they had to say about it. And so then they come to me and say, well, what do you have to say about all this? Well, what could I say? I didn't know what the other people said about me. So all I could say was, well, they're well-known scholars. One of them was Dr. Michael Lamb. I says, he's published a lot. He's done a lot of grants. You know, he's a distinguished scholar. But I couldn't critique what he said about me because they wouldn't let me know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but they were able to, you know, rag on me the whole time. Well, then they really didn't allow me to defend myself either. So when that's the rules you've got to play by, it's pretty discouraging because yeah. everything is set up so that they win and you lose, no matter who's got the facts on their side. Yeah. Well, um, we and you've got, to have, you've, you've got to have lawyers that understand a little bit about the statistics. And in the Florida trial... The lawyer they had was a fairly new guy, and man, he just wandered all over the place trying to figure out what questions to ask me. And I told him up front, I said, you ought to ask these questions, and he wouldn't do it. So my testimony probably sounded very disjointed because I'm sitting there like, why are you asking this question? It doesn't pertain to anything. <laughs> and so, you know, um, if my testimony didn't look very good, it was because my lawyer was confusing me kind of a thing. Um, oh, we've got a few questions from the floor. Uh, one here, Chris, if you just bring the microphone, thank you. Thanks. Even if we could persuade um, either, on? even if we could persuade either the U.S. government or the U.K. government that um, uh, same-sex parent parenting was worse than um, a normal heterosexual um, parenting arrangement that really presumably would only be of interest to the adoption courts and then they're having to weigh up actually is it better for the child to stay in care or to be with um, same-sex parents and and that's even if even if same-sex parenting is worse than heterosexual parenting but better than um, still being kept in care. So can you comment on that sort of the least worst option? Well, um, I, actually, well, if you don't mind, I can start commenting on that from a UK perspective. I mean, part of the whole thing here is that adoption agencies that don't want to place children with same-sex parents have been closed down, right? So if you could change that so that you're allowed to say, I'll only place children with heterosexual parents, that'd be a big deal, right? That'd be a big deal. And that's my initial comment. Well, so what are your thoughts? Well, so this gets to some of the problems that uh, make this a hard issue. Uh, for example, in Florida, they uh, had people define themselves as same-sex parents by checking a box as whether you were homosexual or not. And that's just rife with all sorts of scientific challenges, uh, not to mention any legal challenges. 
uh, people define homosexuality in so many different ways, uh, it's really hard to pin it down. Uh, there's probably people that say that they're gay that have never had sex with anybody or anything, um, but they're politically gay. Uh, there's people who identify as gay who may not be involved in any sort of gay sex. Uh, there's people who are sexually attracted to people of the same gender, but they may be heterosexually married. I mean, there's so many things here that, uh, in a general sense, uh, people who might be considered my opponents can just play mind games till the cows come home. Well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What do you think about this? And when I was at the trial, I had read about this, and I, God, I need an answer on this one. And so they come up to me and say, well, uh, what do you think about this? And I said, you know, there's many factors that go into being a good parent. And your sexual orientation is only one of them. But, you know, you've got attraction, you've got behavior, you've got identity, and you've got four other possibilities that some scholars have looked at in terms of how to, how to define whether you're a same-sex parent. <laughs> and then there's probably another 10 or 15 factors as well. But I said, we'll settle on, I think it was 11 or 12. And I said, you know, each one of these could be yes or no. And if you factor all this out, it comes out to 66,256 or something. And I said, you know, which one of them do you want me to pick to answer? And that really snubbed her. <laughs> and that's the problem. Uh, you know, there are undoubtedly some same-sex parents who are wealthy, well-educated, you know, well-trained in parenting. They may make better parents than some low-income, low-educated, you know, abused as kids' parents or something. I mean, that's what makes it really difficult because you can always cherry-pick by picking a worst heterosexual example and then you pick the best same-sex parent example. And guess what? If you do that, the same-sex parent couple may end up looking pretty good by comparison. Um, but if you Created, created everything equal so that all of the differences between the parents were the same except for same-sex parenthood, then you could probably expect to see some differences. But that very seldom happens uh, for a variety of reasons. So that's why it's very difficult to try to come up with a ban, say, on same-sex parents adopting because people are going to find, you know, really high-class examples. I mean, in the Florida trial, there were two gay men, and each one of them was working half-time, and I think they were both probably making more money than I am, working just half-time. And, you know, they seemed like, I didn't know much about them, but they seemed like nice enough guys. And it's hard to make a onesie-twosie judgment here as a scholar, because I look at things from one over the world, you know, from 30,000 feet. Once you get down to 10 feet, you can find examples of almost anything you want to find an example for, uh, good or bad. I'm sure you can find Christian families that are horrible. I'm sure you can find Muslim families that are wonderful. I mean, whatever you want to find at 10 feet, I bet you can find it. Sure. Um, Lisa, I'll come, to, I'll come to you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, this has been very, very interesting. Uh, Andrea has been connected with Bobby Lopez, who is a uh, who was raised by two mums who loved him, etc. Um, the children of same-sex parent parents um, seem to be starting to band together to come out, as it were, to tell their story. Um, do you think this could be a fruitful line of pushback, given the? Uh, present hostility such research as yours uh, encounters, sadly. Um, do you think listening to people with the t-shirt say, this is my experience? And it, uh, Bobby is very careful. He doesn't damn his mothers, but he says it definitely foisted a loss on him as uh, growing up as a youngster. So your comments? Well, I personally, I'm a scientist and I'm supposed to use logic. And it's very possible for children of same-sex parents to base an emotional appeal on how bad it was or how good it was. There's a gentleman from Iowa who was testifying during the same-sex marriage cases 
about how great he is, his mother's raised him. Um, and you can find people who say how terrible it was that their mothers raised them. In my dilemma as a scientist, I'll admit that these, you know, anecdotal examples are very emotionally appealing, depending on which side you're on. But they're not really science, from my perspective, uh, because everything's, you know, a bell curve. And so you can find examples on the far side of either side for almost anything you want. And so I personally try not to be swayed too much by emotional appeals because I know that you can find them on either side to try to promote your cause. And so people go hunting for folks like this in order to do that. And so it might work. I mean, a lot of people uh, pay attention to emotional appeals, uh, particularly if they reinforce their own ideas. Uh, but from my perspective, it's not really a scientific uh, approach. Um, Richard Page, uh, you want to ask a question? Um, Richard was the magistrate who lost his position for over this whole issue. Richard. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to ask you a question that it was two years ago when I lost my first case um, about uh, single sex people adopting children. And um, I then looked up on the internet and I found that in America, the, they'd had single sex uh, adoption for 20 years, whereas in Britain they'd only had it for 10 years. And the, in America, the, when they go through puberty, they go absolutely ballistic and they have no idea who they are and what sex they are or anything like that. Whereas up until they go through puberty, they're reasonably well looked after. I, is that what you know about in America? Well, it's true that uh, a lot of states approved of single parenting adoption regardless of the person's sexual orientation. I think because they probably figured it was nobody's business. And you could be discreet about it and nobody would know. Um, the issue about puberty is very important because when it comes to sexuality, a lot of the early studies that looked at whether children of same-sex parents were more likely to become gay or lesbian or bisexual looked at children that were like eight years old. So they'd go up to this eight-year-old and say, hey, are you bisexual? The kid looks at him like, what's that? Okay, that's a no. It wasn't until they started looking at children who were, you know, 15 years old or 20 years old or 25 years old that they began to see differences. And so... In the Gartrell study, for example, uh, they looked at children at age two and I think age five and 10 and then 17. And, you know, there were not a lot of differences until they got to 17. And then they found out that about half of the girls and I think 22% of the boys were somewhat non-heterosexual. Um, you know, there was a study uh, done about 1999, which I didn't discover until a couple of years ago because it was buried deep in the dissertation on gender roles. Uh, they looked at children of same-sex parents and found 57.5% were non-heterosexual. But these were adults compared to 4% of the children of heterosexual parents. Uh, the study has been deep-sexed in the literature. I mean, even though they had, I think, 180 parents altogether, maybe even more than that, so it was a very large study compared to most, uh, but you probably have never heard of it. Um, one lady, uh, Sirota, did a dissertation in 1997. She looked at the daughters of gay fathers, and most of these fathers had been in heterosexual marriages and they divorced. And something on the order of 30 to 35 percent of the daughters were non-heterosexual compared to 4 percent of the comparison group of daughters. That um, you know, heterosexual fathers. And so she was almost forced to recant her research when I published an article that mentioned it. Uh, she kind of got in hot water. And if you look it up on the internet, she's kind of like saying, well, my research shouldn't be used to argue that. Well, she didn't say that until, you know, somebody put the heat on her for my having exposed it. So, uh, Again, a lot of times you've got to look at the adult outcomes. You know, sometimes it's like Gollenbach did a study in 97 and published a major book, and she looked at the employment status 
of children of lesbian mothers versus heterosexual mothers. And I think in both groups, she was using single-parent heterosexual mothers. In both groups, if I remember right, the unemployment rate was like 65% in both groups. Well, that's not really anything to brag about. But because she was taking kind of the worst of heterosexual people and comparing them to same-sex couples, you know, she found they were about equal. But even there, if you look at sexual orientation, she'll claim there were no differences because only two of the lesbian daughters, or the daughters of lesbian mothers, were lesbian themselves. So it was only 8%. But if you look at attraction or behavior, then and you dig into whether they had attraction or not, um, almost all of the daughters that had attraction, felt same-sex attraction, had engaged in the behavior, or at least experimented with it. Uh, whereas that wasn't the case with the uh, daughters of heterosexual parents. Now this will get twisted around where pro-gay folks will say, that, well, that's the evil of compulsory heterosexuality, that those mean heterosexual parents are denying their children the right to be gay. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, to me, it's almost humorous, because no matter what comes out, they'll find a way to twist it around and uh, make it look um, bad on our side. <coughs> Dr. Shum, we really appreciate your research and all the work that's gone into it and all the detailed analysis that we're just getting a taster of um, today, but there's a lot more in the book, obviously. Uh, we're so grateful for the work you're doing. We really appreciate it. We thank you so much for it, and thank you for taking the time as well to talk to us today. Can we give him a round of applause? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's... Well, thank you very much for your time. Um, you know, they have my email. You can send me more detailed questions if you want. I, my army background makes me willing to take any kind of question. You know? <laughs> so I try not to hide from anything. Um, I think that we, when we look at someone with such an army background and with such uh, extraordinary and meticulous research, um, but who says that he almost finds it humorous um, if it weren't so serious. Um, that when presenting the evidence, there's always a way to get round it or to um, find, um, find a way through. And, and I think that at the Christian Legal Centre now, we're 20 years down the track and actually a bit more than that, doing cases, uh, very seriously trying to make legal, the legal argument within court, pleading the case, pleading the science, um, having judges distort it. <laughs> I mean, you, you've, you've heard what Dr. Shum said. I, I mean, I, I actually find it comforting um, when you get an expert of such background who will um, testify in front of you what it's like to testify in court, what it's like to seek to present the evidence within academic institutions, and for it to be twisted or vilified. Or, um, and, but worse then comes when... Um, that those that, that those that should support, those that should see, do not, but believe the rhetoric, believe the way in which it's been twisted and not apply properly. Now, the answer is that we have to keep on pressing on, and the answer is that we have to keep on pressing on with the truth, because the truth um, will win. The truth wins, will always win, um, and the truth will win in the end, and history will prove this, and this book is part of the living history, and um, the, this book is part of what means that those that come, that those that, that are at the act now, but also those that come next, those that are serious, will continue to have more and more evidence with which to speak out clearly. There will be a new generation of judges. There will be a new generation of medics and scientists and academics. Um, and the evidence will continue to build. And it's our job uh, to, um, to equip them uh, to keep on pushing this out and to give people the courage to keep on speaking out and um, to, to trust that these things will win through um, in the end. And of course, as someone deeply committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, knowing that there is not one facet of public life uh, over which he is not Lord and King and that this is the truth that we have, uh, that we have published through this book and so I would like you, as people that are here, because you believe that too, 
um, to keep on promoting this book, to keep on promoting the work that men, that we do at Christian Concern and the Christian Legal Centre, but also the various other organisations that are here, um, uh, Representative Voice for Justice, Lisa Nolan's uh, group, we've got the Christian Medical Fellowship, we've got Core Issues Trust represented here. Um, so we've got political, uh, we've got uh, David Curtin of UKIP here. So there are various folk that are uh, represented here. Um, so thank you for what it is that uh, you do. We've all got um, Centre for Bioethical Reform, Brefoffs here. So a number of groups here represented. The Wilberforce Academy, so raising up the next generation. That's a lot of people who are invested in uh, the truth in public life and next generation that are here.